Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome now officially for me as well. My name is Iris Hilbrich, and I would like to welcome you all on behalf of the whole Center for Advanced Studies Futures of Sustainability to the opening of our conference, Ruptures, Transformations, Continuities, Rethinking Infrastructures and Ecology. First of all, we are delighted to be able to gather here today, at least in a digital form, and to open the conference with a very special guest. Sheila Jasinov, a very warm welcome, and thank you for taking the time to open our conference, despite the fact that it's Thanksgiving and we're definitely interrupting your family time. So thank you for making time for us. We're real, really honored. So over the next days, um, we will be devoting a number of very interesting contributions to the question of what role infrastructures play in the discourse on sustainability. As the conference title suggests, by looking at ruptures, but also transformations and continuities, we want to explore the meaning of infrastructures in the context of the ecological crisis, and also its implications for multiple future trajectories of sustainability. Before I hand over to the co-director of our research group, Zikad Neko, who will give a short overview of the work we do here in Hamburg, I would like to very briefly mention the technical procedure as you have all noticed, the keynote is being recorded right now, and the video will then be available on our YouTube channel, Futures of Sustainability. So when the keynote um, presentation is finished, the recording will also be finished, and the following discussion will not be recorded. This might take a minute because you then have to confirm you want to be part of the discussion. If you have questions or comments for Sheila Jasinov after the presentation, we will be really happy to engage in direct conversation, which means everyone is invited to turn on their videos and ask their respective questions personally. There will then be a button where you can raise your hand, like a virtual hand, so I can see you and your questions. Yeah, so much for the technical proceedings. Again, it's great to all have you all here with us today. And I'll now turn over to Zikat Neckel. Before we look forward to Sheila Jasinov's talk, who I will introduce in more detail afterwards. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Iris. Uh, a warm welcome from my side as well. As uh, Iris already mentioned, my name is Sikat Neckel. I'm the spokesperson of the Humanity Center Futures of Sustainability here at Hamburg University and one of its two directors uh, together with my colleague, uh, Frank Adloff. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, that you are all with us today at this conference on infrastructure and ecology, and I hope that you are all doing very well. Our Humanity Center, the Future Futures of Sustainability, that was established two years ago by funds of the German Research Foundation, has a special analytical interest in the topic of this conference. In our analytical framework, the possible futures of sustainability are designed specifically as modernization, transformation, and control. Whereas modernization implies moderate adjustments towards the ecological crisis within the current institutional framework, transformation marks a fundamental socio-ecological change with a far-reaching consequences for the economy and the everyday life. Control, on the other hand, represents a future of sustainability in which ecological states of emergency demands for authoritarian political power and technical instruments of enforcing resilience against climate change and ecological catastrophes. Infrastructures play a central role in all of these three development paths. Ecological modernization does not work without a technical infrastructure that would be able to separate economic growth from further increases in emissions and resource consumption. Socio-ecological change, on the other hand, needs material infrastructures as common goods that are both accessible to everyone and sustainable for the environment. And finally, control is largely based on a 
socio-technical infrastructure without which even authoritarian measures in dealing with ecological disasters would no longer be possible today. By being interested in the ruptures, transformations and continuities of infrastructures amidst the ecological crisis of the present, this conference promises new insights on what important infrastructures have for ecological destruction, but also perhaps for overcoming it. For this reason, I wish all of us an interesting conference with many vivid discussions. And now I hand over again to Iris. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Sikat. Um, well, our guest has built and shaped the field of science and technology studies like no other. Her impressive and manifold career has, has taken her through various posts as a trained chemist, as a linguist, and also a legal scholar to positions at Harvard and Cornell, among others. Sheila Jasanov's work looks at the role science and technology play in the law, but also in policy and politics of modern democracies. She devotes particular attention to environmental and also biotechnology regulation in Europe and the US. She's also particularly concerned with the construction of public reason in various cultural contexts, and also with the role of science and technology in national and global institutions. Sheila Jasinov is currently a Pforzheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. She is affiliated with the Department of the History of Science and Harvard Law School, and also Harvard's Solar Geoengineering Research Program. Previously, she was Professor of Science Policy and Law at Cornell University and founding chair of Cornell's Department of Science and Technology Studies. At Harvard, she founded and directs the Kennedy School Program on Science, Technology, and Society, STS. She has also been, a, I'm sorry, a visiting professor all around the globe, including places like Yale, Kyoto, Melbourne, Vienna, and Paris. In addition to countless awards, which I cannot all list here, such as the Hirschman Prize, the Humboldt Foundation's Reimer List Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a Cross of Honor from the Austrian government, and membership in the Royal Danish Academy. She is the author of over 120 articles and author or editor of over 15 books. So from, from the multitude of publications, I would like to refer in particular to one book by Sheila Jasanov on socio-technical imaginaries, which significantly shapes the work in our research center and also shaped the conception of this conference. In 2015, she co-edited a volume with Sang Yung Kim, which was published by the University of Chicago Press called Dreamscapes of Modernity, Socio-Technical Imaginaries and the Fabrication of Power. So um, as outlined, we do not refer to sustainability as a normative category in our work, but the central question guiding our research here in Hamburg is how modern societies change when they are guided by different imaginaries of sustainability. So with the concept of socio-technical imaginaries, Jasanov and Kim point to a blank space. They emphasize the importance of grasping and connecting socio-technical developments in modernity with the concept of imaginations. As social practices, collective socio-technical imaginaries are embedded in, quote, assemblages of materiality, meaning, and morality, end of quote. Thus, on the one hand, the material foundations of practices of imagining can be revealed, as well as the potential tensions that exist between different future imaginations of sustainability. Moreover, if socio-technical imaginaries have not yet stabilized, science and society alike still have an important role in shaping their future development. Sheila Jasano speaks here of the co-production of a specific social order in favor of other conceptions. So within the next two days, our conference wants to discuss the preservation development, but also the potential disorder of infrastructure by different actors and practices 
against the background of specific imaginaries of sustainability. The latter are often seen as implicit starting points for the consolidation of structural change. At the same time, here again speaking with Sheila Jasanoff, these imaginaries are always dependent on the structures already in place, which continue to shape and constrain them. Sheila Jessenov shows how infrastructures, imaginaries, and the scopes of actions bound to them thus have an interdependent relationship. So the potential struggles for multiple future trajectories of sustainability, which we're interested here in Hamburg, are thus always struggles for the modernization of, the transformation of, control over and through material, immaterial, and planetary infrastructures. We will talk more about the content of the conference tomorrow. So for now, enough has been said from my side. Sheila, we're honored to have you with us today with your presentation, Spaceship or Stewardship, Imaginaries of Sustainability in the Information Age. Thank you so much, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Iris, for that kind and generous introduction, and Iris and Sikhard, both of you, for inviting me to this conference, which is really bringing together, I think, all of the central themes of modernity and what kinds of futures we should have and embrace. So it is, for me, a real pleasure and honor to be speaking to this group as well, and I'm looking forward also to the discussion that will follow the talk. Um, so it's always a huge challenge, you know, what slice out of an ongoing body of work should one present. But since you say that the dreamscapes of modernity and the idea of imaginaries has uh, linked up so um, well with the kinds of things that you're thinking about, I, I took that notion of imaginaries as central and thought I would, in a way, discuss with you or speculate with you about the, the normative underpinnings that we see um, in the kinds of transformations we see ahead. So before I start sharing the screen, I'm tempted to say something, you know, a little bit uh, off the formal trajectory of the talk because of this background that you all are using for today's conference. So it's a highway interchange. And in a way, if you look at it from far away, it's really quite beautiful. It looks like a kaleidoscope. It looks like small bits of glass that have been arranged against a background. I mean, it, it could be an artwork, but I've been working on policy responses and social responses to the pandemic for the last 18 months or so in a large comparative study. And at the beginning, we asked all of our participating 16 countries to send us pictures. And it was striking how many of the pictures were of highway interchanges, except the little bits of glass were missing in a sense. There were no cars. And it, it was in a way a massive demonstration of this idea of transformation. Uh, but one particular view of the infrastructure, because it's not that the roadways and the highways had disappeared. It was that human traffic had disappeared. And obviously one of the catastrophist imaginations that dystopian novelists have been presenting to us for a very long time is that our infrastructures remain behind. The built things, the, the, the pieces of the infrastructure that are material and visible, and it's ourselves, our ways of life that in some way become erased. So this COVID experience has been a time of reflection for many of us because so many forms of sociality have been dissolved all of a sudden, you know, like the public infrastructure of schools, for instance, in many parts of the world for weeks and months at a time. Um, I think we're coming to this topic with a different sense of the, in the, intertwining of the physical, the material, and the social, and the moral, the normative. So it's from that sort of recent experience that I want to talk to you. But with that, let me share my screen and move to the prepared part of this morning's presentation. So it was, of course, a challenge from the very beginning. I mean, what does one even um, take as a title for a conference that has such wide-ranging 
um, uh, ambitions for the topics that it's going to um, take on. But these two words, spaceship and stewardship, for me, bracket many of the kinds of binaries and tensions that your conference, I think, um, attempts will be attempting to dig into. Um, and I want to dwell a little bit on both of these words and suggest that both have infrastructures. They are not merely conceptual words. I think in general, words that have meaning in society always have infrastructures attached to them, meaning-making apparatuses in some sense. And I think what STS contributes to that discourse is whereas the humanities before may have thought that it was words in themselves or words in um, collaboration with other forms of art, I think science and technology studies puts the products of our scientific and technological imaginations completely in conversation with imaginations that are expressed in other ways by human creativity. So I'm going to be talking throughout about these interlinked infrastructures of materiality and meaning making and their normative stakes, what is attached to them. So there are origin stories and like any uh, transforming concept, sustainability has its own origin story. And of course, one has to be skeptical about all origin stories and understand this is one of many possible origin stories, but an important one because people have embraced it as that. People have chosen to give this image meaning as an origin story. And it is, of course, the so-called pale blue dot, the first really complete picture of Earth that came back from the the Apollo voyages that the United States engaged in from the late 1960s to the early 1970s. It was one of these perfect images of Earth, not a partial Earth rise, not a partially eclipsed model, but the entire roundness of the Earth with cloud formations, but cloud formations that were sparse enough and thin enough that one could actually see the outlines of continents. And there, of course, you see Africa and the lower part of the Arabian Peninsula. And this became an iconic image, as I'm sure everybody in this audience knows. Uh, right around the turn of the century, I was doing in the last decade from the 1990s to 2000, I was actually tracing the image itself. And it appeared there was a concentration. It was mostly in North America, as one would have accept, expected, but it was appearing in all kinds of locations. So, you know, I would go into a hotel and there on my pillow would be a little card saying, think twice before you ask for your sheets to be laundered. And in the background would be this image. So it was really widely dispersed. But I was also specifically curious about the dispersal in the global south. And I happened to be in India at the turn of the millennium in December and January of 1999 to 2000. And I was explicitly looking for earth images. And the only time in a tour of India that went from east to west and a little bit from north to south, I only found one image, one place where this particular image appeared. And it was in something that was advertising itself as an IT center in Calcutta, up many floors in an, in an apartment block. Elsewhere, the millennium in India was full of earth images, but they were pictures of the globe or of in, in some sense, cartoon version circles with longitude and latitude lines drawn on them. So this spaceship um, plant, pale blue dot image that was ubiquitous in America was almost nowhere to be seen in India. And that to me illustrated something about the role of infrastructures in conditioning our imaginations. And the fact that these infrastructures that we operate with 
are radically different throughout the world. In any case, the image obviously had a transforming impact on the imagination of environmental thinkers. In 1987, the Brundtland Commission issued its famous report, Our Common Future, probably the most famous dry report of at least the latter half of the 20th century. And in it, as we know, they defined sustainable development, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This has again become almost banal in the thinking and talk of environmentalists, but I think it's important to go back to the Ur texts as it were. And this of course brings together some of the bracketing themes, the, the structural themes of this conference. So in particular, sustainability and the future so what does it mean to think about sustainability in futuristic terms? Engineers think about the sustainability of their buildings. It's not a good thing if a bridge falls down, but the future is not yet built. So how do we project sustainability into a thing called the future? So I want to make a little bit of a detour through uh, theorizing in STS. Uh, and I want to situate the idea of socio-technical imaginaries um, which is one of the ongoing themes of the workshop and of my work as well, uh, back inside a deeper theoretical grounding in STS. And that grounding begins with the word co-production. Co-production has multiple meanings, and again, in environmental discourse, but in STS, it means something very specific. And it, it, it means a blurring or even a denial of the boundary between is and ought. So one of the foundational lines of modernity, that the world is as it is, and our moral choices are as they are, and they're two separate domains. This is something that the idea of co-production in STS challenges, and I think at least problematizes, if not denies. So it begins with the proposition that the worlds that we know are not independent of our norms and our normative instincts, that the worlds we bring into being through scientific knowledge and through technological manipulations are also worlds that in some sense we want to grapple with and live in. So for instance, dreams of flight by far preceded the actual invention of flying machines of one sort or another. People had already had the idea, looking at birds, looking at clouds, that it would be nice for human beings to leave the earth and take flight. And then people kept experiment, experimenting. I mean, whether it was Daedalus or Leonardo or the Wright brothers, and ultimately flight became a possibility but people had long since wished to be like birds, and now we are able to do it in various ways. So many of the sort of governing, defining, discursive terms of environmentalism and ecological modernization are, in this sense, almost like portmanteau words, like Lewis Carroll thought about them, except that they're portmanteaus in that they carry both this normative dimension and the technological infrastructural dimension. And I've just put some words there for us to think about during the rest of the talk. The co-production, like any good theoretical language, um, allows itself to be operationalized. So when do we see co-production? And we see co-production at these moments of transformation, which is another of these words that you will be talking about for, for the next two days. So these are moments when there is an emergence, when something new appears in the world, or when there's controversy between competing ideas of what should be and what is. At moments of portability, when ideas get transported from one place into another, and standardization, when people try to iron out the frictions in the definitions of terms and the meanings accorded to language. And as different cultures take up each other's products and productions, because those are moments at which divergent ethical assumptions come into full view. And then 
not only is it important to think about the times at which one sees co-production or the contexts, but also the mechanisms by which the co-produced world then becomes stabilized. And these are moments when identities and subjectivities are reshaped, when new institutions come into being, when there are new discourses that stabilize a set of meanings or impose a set of meanings, and representations, which for me are both scientific representations and technological ones. So infrastructures are a kind of representational manifestation of co-produced worlds in which is and ought are indelibly bound together. So it's against that backdrop of co-production that several of us began thinking about, well, what does it mean to have change then? Because if co-production is about stabilization, how does change come about in the, against that backdrop? And this is where the idea of sociotechnical imaginaries comes from, since many people in this audience are quite deeply familiar with the ideas. I'll only point out a couple of things. The first um, demonstration that these imaginaries are in some sense structured and that work in our world and environmental domains, that came out of my long running cross-national research. Uh, the cross-national research has been extremely fruitful in my own research because it shows that we as organized human societies, certainly at the national scale, are capable of articulating and realizing very different kinds of futures based on the same raw materials in a sense. So the reception of nu nuclear power, which is such an important topic in Germany, uh, has been so radically different in Germany from other countries, but also between the US and South Korea, uh, as uh, we discovered, Sang Hyun Kim, my co-author and co-editor and I, that it was worth comparing what was going on at the national scale that made one country so much more receptive to nuclear power than the other. And so the original definition in the article that we wrote called Containing the Atom, um, explicitly talked about socio-technical imaginaries at the national scale, but that didn't mean that we thought it was only at the national scale. And in dreamscapes of modernity, we widened the definition to refer to any collectively held vision that is also institutionally stabilized and capable of being articulated through public performance. So these two definitions should not be seen as contradictions of each other. They're just artifacts of the materiality of scholarly production, if you will, that the very first broaching of the topic was in the context of cross-national analysis. And then because sociotechnical imaginaries are a way of working out co-production in practice, of course, there are both descriptive aims and normative aims. Uh, so on the descriptive side, why do we see these um, well, sorry, what, you know, what are the differences that we see and what kinds of factors can we identify that account for them? And um, also on the reception side. So this is another feature of STS that's worth underlining over and over again. STS is not merely about bringing artifacts into the world or ideas into the world. It's also about the uptake and reception. And by the way, this is why I think STS is a profoundly humanistic field because meaning making, uptake, reception are central to my vision of science and technology studies. And then the normative aims are to dig deeper and ask, you know, what is it in the way of common ethical sensibilities or moral commitments that allow us to keep certain kinds of infrastructures in place, sometimes against demonstrations of deep injustice. So the turmoil that's happening in America right now around systemic racism and anti-racism is a demonstration that, you know, although we lived through, well, Americans lived through a civil war and many moments of liberalization and equalization of racial differences, something systemic remains behind. And that is infrastructure. So what are those normative commitments that have not shifted in spite of other things having shifted? So these are the deep inquiries in 
but almost a physical sense that you have to get into archaeology in the Foucauldian sense and deeply embedded because they're institutionalized and almost become invisible in certain respects. So with that, let's come back to the future because that is part of our challenge for this conference and in general. So what does it mean to talk about the future in imaginaries terms if imaginaries are combining the normative with the material and the epistemic, then the future emerges as a profoundly political space. It's political because it's normative. It is a space that's worth struggling for in some sense. It's a space where it's not understood necessarily who the collectives are. In that sense, it's unformed and yet who the community is going to be that's going to realize itself. And this is not any longer a thing that's limited to nation states. I mean, for instance, you know, when indigenous populations around the Arctic unite because they share an identity in being vulnerable to climate change and like the canaries in the coal mine, you're seeing a powerful political identity, a collective emerging that is arguing for a particular kind of future. So that is another dimension of the politics of future making, making tractable. I mean, so how does one get one's arms around or one's head around the future? And we see that these ways of calculating and measuring themselves are exercises of imaginative power and can operate in diverse different ways and then making accountable. So in English, for sure, counting and accounting are very closely related to each other etymologically, but the one is about rendering measurable or tractable. The other has this other meaning of making um, understandable to others. And so this is the public reason dimension. And it calls into question whose voices are represented in the, the previous ideas, how is it being made normative, collective, and tractable? And to whom are the answers to those questions then accountable? So that brings us to a lot of basic political questions, which I'll just run through quickly. I mean, so if we're talking about imaginaries, from what standpoint are we discussing this? And my first comments about the millennium in India go back to this point that in India, there were millennial images of the earth. And I took, uh, I made a collection of some of them. Mostly they were of parched earth. So the Indian imagination of the non-sustainable future was of drought. And one saw those images everywhere. But the standpoint from which one wants to remake the future looks rather different if one is on the left-hand side as opposed to the right-hand side. A different thing, energy systems. Again, these are pictures taken at roughly the same time. A nuclear power plant in Wales. And of course, one couldn't even come near them. And cow dung patties drying on a hut roof in India, different infrastructures, same world, but which is the baseline from which sustainability is going to be calculated and brought into being? Through what instruments? The experiential ones of people leaving their home in floods. Germany has had disastrous floods very recently, one of the most modernized and ecologically conscious countries in the world, but people died. I mean, this was a catastrophic event that somehow had not been planned for. But on the left, with those charts and graphs, we think we are in control in some sense because we understand the mechanisms, we understand the technical devices and the monitoring tools through which we can presume to say something like, 1.5 degrees for the earth is the goal that we're striving for. Mm -hmm. So by putting these pictures side by side, I want to get people to think about the fact that the scientific and technological means involve an enormous amount of reductionism and an erasure of what the experiential impact of those charts and graphs will be superimposed on the ways in which people are actually living. And then the normative side, to what effect? This was 
the cover image of one of the most important, but in a way least discussed documents that came out of the sustainability turn at the end of the last century. So everybody in environmentalism, certainly anybody in an environmental studies program in America knows our common future and can say something about it and they know what the Brundtland Commission is. But if you say global warming in an unequal world, their eyes will glaze over, they won't know what you're talking about. And yet, if we want to talk about imaginaries, this volume produced out of the Center for Science and Environment in India presented a vision of co-production and a radical challenge to the ideas of sustainability that were emerging in the global north. Um, and there were these normative presumptions embedded in this text that were not anywhere else at that time. So the cartoon, which shows an American, it's even called the Yo Amigo cartoon, because again, it's probably the most important bit of, of very uh, black humor in environmentalism. Um, the clearly American, you know, pickup truck driver belching smoke from the, from the back of the truck, telling the impoverished uh, person who's living on natural fuel, the tree, not to cut it down because it's going to save the earth. And, um, and what the center, for, what the authors of this report said was, don't just look at the total amount of pollution or the total amount of greenhouse gases, ask what the history is, where did this come from? Uh, look at the, the kinds of preferences that gave birth to the world that we're in and then divide up the emissions, that the subsistence emissions of the poor should not be valued the same way in a market arrangement, for instance, as the luxury emissions of the rich. These are terms that they used. And also they questioned the nation state as a measure. So why look at nation states? Why not look at per capita consumption? If we want a global collective, if we want to fight for a future going back to my politics of future making, how should we look at people on the earth as individual people with consumption patterns or as members of nation states and hence entitled to the same level of subsistence that they used to as members of those national formations? So I want to dig a little more deeply into the work that was being done by the Center for Science and Environment as a jumping off point for looking at the competing imaginaries of spaceship and stewardship. So in 1982, two significant documents appeared. One was from the Center for Science and Environment, and it was called the State of India's Environment, the First Citizens Report. The way it described itself was that it was bringing back a report from the field in a sense, because changes in the environment have a direct impact on the lives of people. So on the lives of the people, that's the important thing, not the planet or whatever, the lives of the people, particularly the poor who are dependent on their immediate environment for their basic needs. So almost these words could be highlighted as elements in an imaginary. Who is the future for? Who is the environmental future for? But in the same year, the World Resources Institute, a think tank based in America, published its report on the environment. And in it, they said that the founders saw a need for an institution that would be independent and credible, not as an activist environmental membership organization, so not something like CSE, and would carry policy research, um, particularly in relationship to population and development goals. And that research and analysis has to be both scientifically sound and politically practical. So you see here terms that are very different in connotation from the terms on the left. So where lives of people and particularly the poor are highlighted, in the World Resources Institute, we're talking about populations, which are aggregate, and development, which is a very abstracted mode of speaking. It's not attached to particular 
identities, particular representations, and this idea of scientifically sound, so universalism to be achieved on the back of science and technology, which are to some degree taken to be universal. So there's a politics of knowing involved in these two documents. And I think that they are very relevant to our two imaginaries. CSE explicitly says that it's talking about India. So it's talking about the situation in a particular nation state. And within that nation state, it's a democratizing move because it suggests that the state has not been looking after the citizens' interests. So it's a citizen's report, bottom up, democratizing, attempting to get at the state, and it's not taking care of certain kinds of things. And then they stress that they do not accept outside grants, that this is entirely voluntary, and that it is the testimony of people. So it's a kind of witnessing that gives the authority to the contents of the report. The World Resources Institute, by contrast, says that its focus is on the world and it allows international organizations to provide funding, foundations put the money in, whereas voluntary organizations are supplying the data on the CSE side, it's expert analysts that are looking at the data on the WRI side. And the values, both of these reports are co-productionist in a profound sense because they both say that they're standing up for certain values as well as for forms of knowledge. And those values are quite different from one another. So this is, you know, this is way before the Me Too movement and way before various other anti-racism movements of um, this century, but self-reliant, non-hierarchical, and non-sexist are already values that are being embraced in the, this 1982 report in India, whereas independence and urgency, these are values that are being em embraced um, in the um, global north, as illustrated by WRI. So within STS, there are traditions that help us theoretically understand the move that the WRI, the World Resources Institute, is making. And I go back to a foundational STS text, an article called Drawing Things Together in English by Bruno Latour. And in it, he talks about the way in which the WRI vision, the World Resources Institute vision itself comes into being. So it has an infrastructure and what is that infrastructure? So in this article, Latour talks about some very important things for him, obligatory passage points and centers of calculation, particularly centers of calculation. That term is very important in Latour's own thinking and in science and technology studies. But I would like to suggest that centers of calculation are themselves infrastructures for particular forms of imagination that we might wish to problematize and question. In the article, he describes the um, adventurer, explorer, La Perouse, whose image I showed you in that previous slide. And he goes on a mission, on an imperial mission through the Pacific for Louis XIV, the Sun King, with the explicit mission of bringing back a better map. So that bringing back already suggests that there is a center to which the knowledge returns. So then the tour launches into fable mode, one day landing on an island, he meets with the Chinese, with the Chinese and tries to learn from them, they know geography quite well. I mean, you know, in a way it's like the World Resources Institute experts landing in India, meeting the Center for Science and Environment and finding, oh, they know their own geography quite well. So somebody can draw a map on the sand. This is almost a Borges moment, but another who is younger, I mean, why does Latour want him to be younger? There's a sort of progressiveness narrative built into this, you see youth setting aside age, picks up one of La Perouse's notebooks to draw the map again with a pencil. So this is 
a fable of science, and those of you who are familiar with Latour's work know that he places a lot of emphasis on science as making inscriptions. So the moment at which the younger man draws the map in pencil, he is making something portable and movable. And then what are the differences, says Latour, between the savage geography and the civilized one? Uh, I have always felt a frisson reading this because it's against la mission civilisatrice. And I wonder, I don't think it was meant entirely ironically, but what happens is that the map then gets brought back to Paris, which becomes the center of calculation, and the knowledge is then disseminated outward. So this is very much the model of the World Resources Institute and how we know the planet, how we know sustainability, and what infrastructures we need. As Latour went on to say, in sum, you have to invent objects which have the properties of being mobile, but also immutable, presentable, readable and combinable. So these are the inscriptions of science that allow us to extract knowledge and experience, re-represent them in ways that then become powerful builders of infrastructure for future work, for, the, for this struggle for the space of the future, what kind of future shall we have? And of course, you need machinery and the machinery of the reading has itself undergone massive development since these early days of the computerized revolution, or even this imagination of Buckminster Fuller, a prophet of Spaceship Earth. He wrote a book called Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth, and the Buckminster Fuller Institute in a way juxtaposes that original pale blue dot with what happens when you turn it into a calculable field? So I like this image, which they use on their website, because it almost presents in pictorial form what Latour is talking about and that drawing things together. I mean, you take the, the physical object and you abstract it and you render it calculable, mobile, portable, and then you get your powerful scientific representation. And it has been extremely powerful because I think it's at the root of the way in which we are being taught to think about environment now as part of a new age, an age called the Anthropocene, um, in which you can no longer separate the activities of human beings from the planet, the planet that we live on, and whose sustainability we are obviously concerned with. But what is humanity's role in that Anthropocene? And again, one can juxtapose a Latourian vision that if we have turned the planet into a machine for living us, for ourselves, at the very least, we should love our monsters so we can fold ourselves into the molecular machinery of soil bacteria through our sciences and technologies. We run robots on Mars, we photograph and dream of further galaxies. And yet we fear that the climate could destroy us. And this is a peon against fear. We should learn to instead love our monsters and embrace the transformations. But it's worth setting Ulrich Beck against this Latourian vision. And in his vision, the Anthropocene was not necessarily a place where humans are in control. It's not just a matter of loving our monsters and embracing them. It's that we have lost control of the monsters. And in this short but illuminating essay called Anthropological Shock, he suggests this is a theme that ran through his work, that we have lost sovereignty, that we are not sovereigns partly because we've lost the sensory ability through all these processes of abstraction, how we know the earth is no longer a sensory matter. We do not have the residual sovereignty over our judgment. So, you know, you might see Beck as kind of one playing out of the trajectory of the enlightenment, uh, that it's progressive loss of control 
And you can see Latour as a playing out of the other trajectory of the Enlightenment in which we become progressively more and more in control of ourselves and our fates. Um, there's not a, I mean, let's come back to this in discussion because it's not, what's important to me is that these thinkers embrace such radically different possibilities, but articulate them as if they are the future. I mean, so there's an as if element, which actually takes away agency on both sides. <coughs> All right, so one of the things I'm sure you'll be talking about is in these projects, in these imaginaries, one of the things at play is the question of scale. <coughs> Excuse me. And nowhere is the scalar component more immediately significant than in connection with geoengineering, which is one of these futuristic technologies and designed to protect ourselves against the things that we have already done. And Joseph Amasco points out, in effect, without using this language, that geoengineering itself is a massive act of imagination. So programs for, and he says massive carbon capture, compete with imaginative um, chemical proposals to shift the atmosphere. And these are cumulative, we don't know if they're, what the consequences of this particular foray into the future will be. But these sort of scalar imaginations are very much with us. I think they are a descendant of that Apollo image going through World, World Resources Institute and going through the kind of theorizing that led to the idea of centers of calculation, because here is a set of imaginations about planetary scale interventions mm -hmm. that are going to save the planet from other unintentional planetary interventions that we've launched into across um, the previous couple of millennia, and especially since the Industrial Revolution. So science and technology travel, and those imaginations travel readily, partly through the work of these centers of calculation, as we've seen. But is that the only way in which things travel? Another strand of STS theorizing tells us that we should always be symmetrical, that we should not look only at what science is doing, but also at what society is doing. And maybe the question of how knowledge travels should not be limited to this idea of representing, abstracting, making portable, bringing back to the center, and then re-diffusing it. Do things diffuse in other ways? And I want to suggest that the history of the Center for Science and Environment that I've already talked about is itself a kind of illustration of a very different form of diffusion, a diffusion through the normative line and not through the epistemic line. So the very first citizen's report that this group put together was so handmade that you open the cover and the first page is upside down because the people who glued the cover onto the pages didn't know how to read the right direction of the page. And to me, it has always been emblematic of the, the Indian cottage industry starting point of that report. And here is a movement that began much more in the kind of activity that the Center for Science and Environment documented, the witnessing of activities down at the lived life level. And it illustrates that the traveling did not necessitate an abstraction or a center of calculation. So the term tree hugger became a kind of term of opprobrium actually in American environmentalism, but it has, it has a point of origin and it was powerful. I mean, so this Chipko movement in which people tried to keep modern development from coming into being and cutting down the trees became a worldwide, almost uh, iconic movement for how to organize to prevent environmental degradation of a certain sort. So no centers of calculation involved here, just the normativity of life carrying its own energy and weight. 
And it's been incorporated into law and policy. And I'll just go through this very quickly because these texts are known to a lot of the people, maybe all of the people in this audience, but this is the stewardship side of things that in addition to modernization, in addition to transformation, one should be looking at the parallel question of stewardship. Who is going to take care of the things that we do? Even if you're wanting to love your monster, you know, how is that love going to be implemented in a certain sense? How will it be realized? So the most powerful idea of stewardship is undoubtedly the notion of precaution. And here are just two of the definitions which have been picked up in environmental law and policy, as this audience well knows, the origins of the precautionary principle are usually traced back to German environmental law, but then picked up in the Rio Declaration and the Maastricht Treaty, spelled out in more detail in the EU 2000 millennial communication on the precautionary principle, and then with but words attached that are extremely important for any normative analysis. So it needs to be proportional, non-discriminatory, consistent, based on potential benefits and costs, subject to review, so accountable in some sense. And then there should be responsibility that's assigned for producing um, scientific evidence for, for a more comprehensive understanding. So this is almost a document that tells you how to organize the politics of future making. It gives you a set of normative understandings of how to organize the politics of future making. And in that sense, I think the EU communication of 2000 is itself a text in sociotechnical imaginaries, but it puts forth a much less aggressive version than most of the playings out of the idea of the Anthropocene, because it suggests that one, the, the mantra is reflection, and then it lays out some of the dimensions along which reflection should happen. The French constitution picked up the idea of precaution, so it's even in the constitutional law of a number of countries by now. And the, um, the US has been to some degree a staunch advocate of risk assessment and not precaution. But it's worth reminding ourselves that the very first major American national environmental law, the National Environmental Policy Act of 1969, was in effect written out of the same kind of spirit because it said that the federal government must conduct an environmental assessment and write an environmental impact statement for every major federal action significantly affecting the quality of the human environment. So that is a precautionary move. And in it, just like in the European version where alternatives must be um, considered, the, the NEPA law says that alternatives to the proposed action must be uh, considered and, and public consultation is mandated as well. So if you look at NEPA and if you look at the European law of nearly 30 years later, there are things in common, even though precaution has become one of these fighting words and, and American analysts don't particularly like to work with it. All right, so with all of that as a backdrop and to the, sort of the, moving into the final few minutes of what I want to say, I want to show a site where these two different imaginations, the spaceship version as articulated through universal ideas of sustainability, uh, come into contact with the stewardship idea, the who is responsible for the forms of life, who is actually living them, and who is ethically accountable to and responsible for them. So this Pavagada Solar Park, I visited this in early 2020. It was then billed as India's second largest solar development. Now, a solar park is capitalizing on the idea of renewables as the infrastructure of sustainability, that we should not be using non-renewable fossil fuels, which are in any event introducing 
dangerous elements into the Earth's atmosphere, but instead should be relying on benign energy sources, such as wind and solar. So this is what Pavagada Solar Park looks like. And you arrive there, it's very dusty because it's in a very dry part of India. And yet it looks like a digitally rendered ocean stress stretching into the distance. So these are of course, individual solar panels and you could draw a supply chain back of each and every one of them. And there were Chinese crates lying around packing cartons because this is so new, reminding you that the, the uh, renewability of the sun depends on supply chains that are themselves perfectly social and geopolitical even in their spread and dissemination. We met a person who was in charge of guarding this place. He let us actually come in, and this is my Indian environmental colleague, Leo, Leo Saldana, who was with me at the time. But the interesting story he told us was that he and his brother had been farmers on that land, but they had owned a substantial chunk of property, and it was profitable to them to rent it out to the solar park people with income coming back to them over the next 25 years. And he was getting more money, more assured money this way than he got out of farming. So he was quite happy to switch jobs completely and become the caretaker, you know, dressed in a completely different way and now a representative of the entity that manages the solar park. But the key thing was that he and his brother between them owned enough land that when they leased it, the amount of rental income they got back was higher than what they were getting through farming. We went on and came to a nearby village where people started talking to the members of our group that spoke the local language and said, why did you come to visit? Look what you've done to our communities. And what they wanted to say was that they had no jobs that what had happened was that all of the farms in the locality had been taken over by the solar park and there were no jobs available, including for the young people, because the nearest city, the big city, Bangalore, was like 100 miles away and the transportation was not good. And so the immediate aftermath of installing this renewability in physical terms and in engineering terms was the non-renewability of these cultures that had subsisted on that land since time immemorial. They were, however, extremely friendly to us and insisted that we stay there for coffee before we could go back. So there was a form of renewability of sociality that we, were, that we almost accidentally fell into. And it left me wondering about this term renewable that is so much a link between infrastructure and sustainability in a sense. So I want to conclude by asking this fundamental normative question, what should we care to sustain? My Pavagada experience put two different ideas of renewable side by side. Is it the cultural renewal, the renewal of society as it has been lived as far back as people can remember? Or is it the material renewability of the sun being converted into energy. And some of you will know this catastrophist film the day after tomorrow the, that imagines uh, um, an earth that has suddenly and drastically cooled in the Northern hemisphere so that ice has spread down to the level of Rome and below. And then in the New York Public Library, a group of holdouts who actually survive. They are the sort of pioneers of catastrophe. They are sitting there in the New York Public Library burning books to keep themselves warm. The director was German. And I've always liked this as a sort of crossover of so many strands that one might want to think about. So a German director making a Hollywood catastrophist film uh, about very much a Northern European 
um, imagination of how the world ends. And they're talking in the New York Public Library. And so Elsa and Jeremy have this exchange. Jeremy wants to save a particular book from the burning. And Elsa says, what book is that? And he says, the Gutenberg Bible. Elsa says, you think God is going to save you? No, not God. So why is he protecting it? The Bible, Bible is the first book ever published. It represents the dawn of the age of reasoning. As far as I'm concerned, the written word is mankind's greatest achievement. So, you know, there is this spaceship stewardship thing in confrontation in a catastrophist moment in a Hollywood movie and what comes out of it as being saved. Um, or at least somebody's imagination of what should be saved is the Gutenberg Bible. So what are we talking about on the stewardship side? Um, what are the things that we should be caring about? And what are the things that the spaceship imagination in a way almost bulldozes over? So Nature itself has a kind of mod modesty and regeneration. And if we had time, I would have wanted to talk about Zebald's, um, uh, one of his last essays in which he talked about the regeneration of destroyed cities after, the, after World War II and how the flowers came back into bloom against bombed out sites. And there is, a different imagination of nature, not the one of Pavagada Solar Park that says, let's harness this at the scale of the sun's energy. It suggests a more ecological approach and ecology is again, one of the themes that you're looking at in this conference. But to some degree, the common law, the English common law, the Anglo-American tradition of it, operates in the same way, very experimental, very local, small shifts. And human history on the earth for a long time has not been about transformation. It's been about sustainability in a day-to-day -day sense of the term. So what are the properties of this stewardship way of looking at the earth? It's incremental, happens in small doses. It's provisional because no permanent commitments are being made or promised. It's skeptical, not certain what the outcome will be. It's like pragmatist philosophy. Let's try it out and see what happens. And in that sense, it's experimental, acknowledges that whatever we're trying, these are not once and for all solutions. These are not silver bullets with which we will find sustainability and deal with climate change once and for all. It can be inclusive. This is something that the Indian citizens report was attempting to do, creating a picture of the problem through inclusivity by incorporating many voices, not through the centers of calculation and the abstraction and the representation. And then finally, with an idea of learning learning not from the disasters that have accompanied the more grandiose visions, but from the daily experience, the daily lived experimentation of building on what is now to imagine the future of what is to become. So with that, let me thank you for your attention and move into the discussion part of our session.